All right, welcome everyone to uh, this month's Inside Signature. My name is David and I'm the Director of Education here at Signature. Thanks to all of you for joining us today here in person and thanks to our friends joining us via YouTube. Um, for those of you that have never been to one of these events before, it's a pretty simple format. We wanna keep this a casual conversation. I'll ask our friend and our guest who I'll introduce in a moment some questions. And if at any point you have a question here in person, just raise your hand good and high. And I'll call on you at an appropriate moment. My friends who are watching online, if you have a question at any point, you just throw it into the chat and James will pass it on to us um, when at, at an appropriate moment. Uh, a couple of things that are coming up here uh, at Signature over the next few weeks. Uh, Pacific Overtures closes this Sunday. If you don't have a ticket, you might not be able to get one. It's, it's, a, it's a bloodbath right now to, to get tickets as they're popping up, so best of luck. Uh, other things that are coming up, we have our, our next Merrily We Sing Along as we continue our uh, celebration of Stephen Sondheim this season. April 14th, we have a West Side Story Sing Along here in, in our lobby. Um, should be a great night. Uh, April 25th, here in the ARC, Passing Strange opens, begins previews, runs through June. And next month's Inside Signature on May 4th, we'll be meeting with Raymond O. Caldwell, who is directing Passing Strange. So lots uh, going on here over the next few weeks, and we hope that you'll engage with all of it. Uh, today we have with us Jason Ma, who is currently playing the reciter in uh, Pacific Overtures. And we're uh, so deli delighted to have you here with us today. Thank um, you, David. Yeah. So um, let's, let's talk life story bio a little bit first, OK? OK. Uh, where, where are you from originally? Uh, I'm from, I would call myself a Los Angelino. I'm okay. from Los Angeles, okay. basically. Great. Yeah. And uh, were, you an, were you an artistly little guy, or did you fall into this later? Tell us your actor, artist story. I think uh, from a very early age, I, I love to sort of perform. Yeah. Um, you know, but it was all like as in context of being a child of immigrants. Mm. So uh, just school plays, choir, marching band, orchestra, piano lessons, uh, all the things. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I think at some point in high school, once I uh, started doing musical theater, mm -hmm. uh, I think I began to realize that it was something that uh, made me feel essentially myself the most. Right. And uh, that feeling kind of uh, intensified as uh, I approached adulthood and especially college. And I remember having a conversation with my parents about uh, the possibility of uh, being a professional uh, actor, which uh, they shut down immediately. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the immigrant parent story. Yeah, yeah. and you know they were uh, they were very smart about it. I, I think uh, in many ways they uh, they could immediately see the challenges that would come up for me, mm. and they laid them out very clearly. Uh, uh, basically saying, you know, there's people who, people who look like us don't do this, and especially at the time I was growing up, that was very true. Um, mm. I remember being fixated on Ben Vereen huh. because he was a song and dance man and he was not white yeah. and thinking well that's something that gives me hope yeah. uh, and maybe I could be uh, you know the Asian Gene Kelly or Ben <laughs> Vereen uh, but my parents they were really they were really smart they just said you know that's going to be you're going to have such challenges um, working you're going to have challenges with um, racism mm -hmm. in the business uh, as well as just in the out in the world uh, and uh, it's going to be financially very difficult for you to do this sort of thing uh, and I remember I think my mom or my dad said we'll give you money <laughs> but you're going to be that's going to make you feel bad yeah. you know that yeah. kind of thing and uh, and it was all these all those things they uh, they all came to be, it was very, very true. Uh, I was able to eventually um, make a living uh, as a performer. Um, and they were very, very proud of that. Yeah. And they uh, 
once they realized they weren't going to be able to talk me out of it, yeah. <laughs> uh, they, they were very supportive. My mom, um, until very recently, uh, was able to just fly anywhere to come see me perform. Wow. She just was very supportive. Uh, and, you know, it was a big journey for them to go from... Uh, also, I was really good at math. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I had really good grades, and uh, I think especially for my engineer father, it was... You know, he had a very specific uh, dream for me yeah. uh, that didn't come to pass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did you go to school for musical theater then or for yeah, acting? I, um, you know, I went, uh, it was really just around that period of going into college. So I, I went in as an undeclared major at UCLA. Okay. Um, but I, I think I even knew then because I, it was the easiest way to sort of reduced the friction between my parents and myself yeah. uh, as, as I was going forward. And uh, by the end of my freshman year, I had transferred into the theater department okay. there. Uh, wow, so it happened quickly. It did okay. happen quickly. That's great. Yeah, I had a plan. <laughs> do, you, um, do you remember what your, the, your first show you did was? What's the first thing you ever remember doing? The first thing I remember doing uh, was a Brecht piece okay. called The Cradle Will Rock. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And um, that was uh, the beginning. That was my first show uh, in my freshman year. I do remember also um, auditioning and meeting uh, my friend Alan Muraoka. Okay. He is, uh, he's played Alan on Sesame Street for a number of decades now. He's oh. the grocer uh -huh. uh, who took over for Mr. Hooper, I uh -huh. believe. But he's now actually been in that grocery store for longer than Mr. <laughs> Hooper. Uh, he also uh, has ended up being um, a, a lifelong friend, a collaborator. Mm. Uh, he's a wonderful actor, but he also directs. Okay. And, uh, he's, had, he's directed pieces that I've written, wow. including Gold Mountain. So uh, even back then, you know, we, we formed a, a connection immediately. We were college roommates. and. Um, uh, it's interesting how somebody you meet in your freshman year in college can still be, you know, decades later, mm -hmm. somebody who's so essential uh, to to your life. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, so you, you, you go to UCLA, you graduate, you go straight to New York. What, what, happens, what uh, happens next? I did a lot of, uh, it took me a while to get through UCLA because actually, like, by my, um, the end of my freshman year, I had booked a professional uh, job. Awesome. And uh, so it took me about five and a half, six years. I mean, I actually entered UCLA with uh, a semester's worth of credits already, <laughs> but uh, just the taking breaks to work, uh, it took a while. Yeah. And then um, I think the first thing I did was um, out of school, the LA Company of Cats. Okay. Okay. I love it. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't really have... Um, a plan to come to New York, but mm. New York called me. Um, I think, uh, you know, there were not a lot of uh, Asian performers uh, mm. in the country, <laughs> literally, wow. who did theater. So uh, I, I think I did one of the very first sort of virtual on video auditions back in 1988 or something oh, like what? that. Uh, and they taped me audi to audition for a show here uh, in New York City. Yeah. And um, I, in 1989, I flew to New York and started rehearsals for uh, Chu Chem, okay. which was my Broadway debut. Okay, I don't know it, but yeah, that's nobody great. does. Okay. It's all right. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I love it. Any questions from you all so far, Barbara? Please. Yeah, I have two questions. Um, your your father was an engineer, you said. Uh -huh. Did your mother uh, was she a housewife or did she have a career? And my second question is, you said Cats was your first out of college. Uh, it's like, how do you feel about cats? Oh! <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't like, I'm not a cat person myself, but I'm a cat person in that I didn't mind cats at all. Play. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm going to restate the questions for our online folks. So question one was, dad's an engineer, was mm -hmm. mom a, a housewife, or, or did she have a, an out-of-home career? And the second question was, your first professional gig was cats. How do you feel about cats? Yes. Because that's a show that has some baggage for some people. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So. All right. Let's start with the easy one. Uh, 
My parents um, met at Stanford University. Mm. Um, they're both, uh, our fam they're both their families came to the US or actually left China because of um, political turmoil, war, revolution, um, right before World War II. Um, and uh, they both ended up uh, through very separate paths uh, meeting at Stanford. And uh, back then, uh, for a lot of women, I won't say all women, but uh, I think e even if you were at Stanford, the primary goal was to meet your husband. And um, I'm, I think uh, once my mom met my dad, um, then it was expected that she would be, become a housewife. Mm. Uh, she's really smart and really, uh, really sharp. And uh, we, for a while, we, while my dad was an electrical engineer and actually worked um, with NASA and as well as the wow. US government, he was really, really brilliant. We also uh, owned a Chinese restaurant, uh, a yeah. series of them, um, because uh, I, I think when you're part of a diaspora, um, you know, uh, when things are not secure in your home country and you kind of go through periods of unrest and danger, uh, as well as economic uncertainty, um, there's just, you work and work and work and you make sure your children um, are, have like a big safety net. And I think that's why, uh, even though we could have just lived off my father's salary, we we just did extra things. Yeah. And eventually my mother uh, fell into real estate. Um, hmm. I think uh, she started out as a residential um, real estate broker, but then ended up doing investment properties and becoming really quite successful uh, doing that. And um, we, stopped, we stopped with the Chinese restaurants once <laughs> that happened. Okay. Cats. Cats. <laughs> um, <laughs> At the time, uh, I was really excited to be in Cats, um, just because uh, it was the big deal back right. then. And uh, as uh, somebody who loved to do both sing and dance, uh, it was really a wonderful uh, kind of high profile job. Um, as a writer, uh, I think it's a very interesting piece because it's based on a cycle of poems and it, it is in a in a sense uh, in essence uh, a song cycle right. uh, I think it's a little baffling for audiences um, at first I think visually it's really interesting but I think trying to figure out what's actually happening <laughs> <laughs> on stage um, if you're not a fan of the poems um, might be a little tricky for for people but I, I, I think it's <laughs> it's part of the canon, it is. and uh, we, you know, it is, uh, it is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> yep, absolutely. <laughs> Great. Any other questions? All right. Let's. Um, I want to talk Pacific overtures. Um, yes, let's do that. <laughs> um, show of hands, who has seen this production so far? Okay. Uh, the uh, yeah, we have a couple. We have a cast member here as well in the audience. Uh, uh, and those of you that have not, I hope you are planning to see it. Okay, great. Um, and already have tickets. Yeah. <laughs> um, so for the three or four who have not seen it yet, what is this show? What is the show about? This is a interesting question. I, uh, I think I know now okay. what I probably wouldn't have known before uh, when in my previous interactions with the show, but I think it is about uh, the effect of industrialization, mm. colonization, imperialism, um, on uh, a country, a culture that's thousands of years old and how, what happens when it bumps up against um, like a sort of Johnny-come-lately renegade uh, <laughs> civilization. Yeah. Um, and it's told through the journey of two men, uh, two Japanese men, and how their lives uh, just changed drastically due to the arrival of uh, Comm Commodore Matthew Calbraith Perry in 19th, cent in 19th century. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's really what essentially it is. That, yeah. 
I have spiral thought. I'm, I'm, one thing at a time. I'll come back to something yeah. you said. But um, you've done this show before. Um, what what brought you back to doing it again? What drew you to, to doing it this time? Uh, Ethan Hurd. Okay. Literally Ethan. Uh, you know, Johnny Lee Jr., Johnny Lee Jr., who plays Manjiro, uh, is sitting right there in front of me. <laughs> and uh, he had auditioned um, during the first round of auditions, and uh, he'd also told me that I should audition for this piece. And I said, no, I'm a writer now. I'm retired. Mm. I'm not interested. Uh, and he got cast, and I was looking forward to coming and seeing the show because uh, I, I, we're good friends and um, I wanted to see him play this role <laughs> that I had played 20 oh. years ago. Uh, but uh, months later, I think it was, um, I'd heard that they were still casting the reciter. Mm. And um, so I was encouraging friends to resubmit or submit themselves because I thought, you know, I'd heard about Ethan, I knew who he was. Um, my friend Ali Ewalt uh, was working here um, the previous season mm -hmm. in She Loves Me. And she told me about Ethan's arrival. And it was really exciting to me that uh, there was somebody, um, a, a person of color, an Asian person, was going to be in senior leadership here at this theater. Because uh, that always, um, it brings new energy and it brings new uh, outlooks and lenses uh, into the work that you see. And um, it's, it's been part of, uh, you know, what's been happening in American theater yeah. in general. And so I was really excited that Ethan was here. Uh, so uh, when my agent sent me an email basically saying, because these, they come in every once in a while, is would Jason want to audition for something? And for m over a decade, the answer has always been no. Mm. But I knew what was, what was happening here and I knew who Ethan was, so I said yes. <laughs> and then once we met, I really, really wanted in. Yeah. <laughs> I hadn't felt that hunger to be in a show in so long, but I wanted to work with him. I, I could tell that in, just in the short sort of discussions we had about what he wanted to do with the show, that this was something that he was trying to do that was, would, completely align with sort of the things that I've been thinking about recently mm -hmm. uh, about theater and um, how we portray ourselves yeah. and how, um, how we can take a piece like Pacific Overtures and um, make it into something new. Yes. Uh, and I think he did that. And I, w I was so, uh, it was such a joyful process for me and I think for all of us to be there with him yeah. while he figured out how to do the thing that he had in his head about this piece and mm. uh, his lens on it, especially uh, as an Asian American director. Um, I think this has been directed by American directors who are not Asian and also um, a J Japanese director mm -hmm. has had a couple of uh, shots at this yeah. too. <laughs> but um, an Asian American director um, on, on this is uh, an interesting and I think fairly new thing. Yeah. And so, uh, this is the production that came of that. Yeah, that's fascinating. So, so this production that came of it, how is this production different than the one that you did 20 years ago? Well, the one I did 20 years ago, I think was in a way sort of an update and an homage to the original um, Broadway production mm -hmm. that opened in 1976, which was very kabuki based um, and literally kabuki based. I mean, with the makeup and sort of the style mm -hmm the very sort of high theatrical style of Kabuki. Um, and it was really, really interesting and powerful and beautiful to look at. Um, but I believe that, you know, this sort of style keeps the audience at a remove. Um, and uh, our production literally immerses right. the audience into the world and makes them feel a part of the world. It feels snug in that space. Yeah. Like as soon as I walked in, I was amazed how like, yeah. like I felt like I was enwrapped with yes. something. Yeah. So that's a whole different feeling yeah. as opposed to sitting in a big Broadway house and looking at this sort of very uh, exotic, different, strange world through, um, done in a theatrical style that we don't usually see in the US. Mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to uh, this production, which is like 
sort of immediately, be, the way Ethan has framed it, you feel included yeah. and you start to identify with mm. uh, the people on stage as opposed to looking at yeah. them. Yeah. And I think that's a huge difference. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, the show's almost 50 years old at this point, right? And it's oh not, my gosh. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> which is wild. Um, wow. Yeah. It's, and it's not revived very often. But um, it will be now. I hope so. I, I, I really so. believe that uh, this is a, a good new template. Yeah. Um, I, I think people feel so uh, invested emotionally in this show, uh, which I can't say people usually say that about Pacific well, because Overtures. Because of that distancing, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Um, it's, um, that's so interesting. Uh, I mean, when I saw it, it, would, it would, the energy in the room from the audience was palpable. It was an electric feeling. What, what do you think audiences are connecting to in this story? I think they're connecting to the humans on the stage. Mm. I mean, it's so basic, but, um, you know, the tradition of, of how we're portrayed and who tells us how we portray ourselves in, in this country has been pretty static for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, this production and many others that have been coming out lately have been trying to do something different which is, uh, you know, you, you usually go to a musical and you are supposed to follow with your heart right. the, the people on the stage. And um, that doesn't always happen with, uh, especially with Pacific Overtures. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why, um, that's what's going on. It's yeah. like, it's literally something that we take, uh, we assume to be true of all musicals. It's like you go there with, and somebody takes your heart and you follow right. them around. Uh, and I think that's what Ethan wanted to do with this production. I love that. And uh, I think it's even in the design. You know, our faces are so bare uh, yeah. in the show, and um, we're not covered in kabuki makeup. Mm -hmm. And even um, when we have the wigs on, it's still just our faces. Right. Uh, which I think is really interesting. Um, he's really centering. Uh, the the humanity of the artists mm -hmm. and therefore the humanity of the characters and the humanity of uh, Asian bodies right. in space right uh, and uh, that that's all we could ask for yeah. that's all we really want is just to um, to be able to tell our stories in this particular way uh, it's it's not always true for yeah. us that's that's fascinating uh, any questions from our audience yes Sarah. Great. So the question uh, was, uh, you've been writing for a decade plus. Uh, ha has that changed how you approach a role on stage, particularly in this case, the, the reciter? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Uh, especially for something as precious as Sondheim and, um, and Weidman. Uh, I, I, I become such a super fan of their writing yeah. by inhabiting it as as an actor uh, in a way uh, that's different than before because as I think before without the writing lens mm. uh, I would just try to inhabit the character and tell the story which is still something I want to do but I also get this bonus of enjoying and working on the words themselves so um, I think it makes me a much more sort of articulate and uh, literary presence mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, especially for this particular version of the reciter and who I want has, to talk about literally him. walks on with yeah. a book <laughs> right. in hand yeah. uh, and is dressed basically like a, half the guys in the audience yeah, right. uh, I, I think it really serves serves the piece well mm -hmm. and sort of serves uh, Ethan's vision of it well is that uh, you have somebody who's really very uh, very much into the language yeah. and the story and the structure uh -huh. of um, of what what is happening um, around him. So uh, it is. It's been this really interesting meta version 
of uh, the show. I think there's a lot of that going on in the storytelling. So who is this reciter? Because it's a pretty different take on, the, if you look at the original production, it's, it's a drastically different take yes. on the character. Uh, the first sketch, the first costume sketch of um, the reciter that I looked at looked like Ethan Hurd. <laughs> and uh, that was my first clue that, oh, <laughs> I get it. We're, uh, we're, and Ethan, uh, in our rehearsal script, also um, added some stage directions for, for us, oh. for our particular production, um, just to give us clues as to what he was thinking. And he described uh, the reciter as um, a contemporary uh, Asian American man in Sherlington, Virginia. Huh, okay. <laughs> uh, so, I think that so we are here. We yeah. are here, and yeah. you are here with us, and I am here with you. Love that. Uh, so I think that's. It was very much just about basing the character on on me and Ethan, mm -hmm. uh, who would say these words that were written by John Weidman, yeah. who is a writer, and so I'm a writer, and <laughs> so. And it helps that you, that it's coming from this book because because some of it is high language. That's, yes. That's, yeah. So that makes sense. I like that. Yeah. I like that a lot. We have a question from online. Uh, so this is a question. Did Jason speak to the beginning and ending moments of the show, specifically the group check-in that happens at the top of the show and the other moment of stillness at the end of the show following next? All right. So the question was, can we talk about uh, the, the, the beginning and the end of the show? We begin with a check-in with the, with the actors together, and then there's a moment of stillness uh, with the cast at the end. Talk about the, the top and the, and the close. Uh, you know, the top is my, one of my favorite moments in the show. Um, I think, you know, I don't honestly know intellectually what it means. Yeah. Um, I, I, well, actually, maybe I do. Uh, the, the prologue of um, bringing the book on and kneeling and creating a sacred space in our little square mm -hmm. of sand and soil uh, is um, very much about just um, prepping the audience for uh, a journey, mm -hmm. um, one that is abstract and not always literal. Yeah. Uh, but that moment of check-in with the cast, it's kind of brilliant. And weirdly, uh, I, you know, we just, I did another, uh, I was involved in another production where we did that as well. And it was also, a cast of Asian people hmm. um, telling a story about ourselves. And I th think it's just something that may be in the air right now, that we are, we are basically creating a tribe, creating hmm. a safe space for ourselves, um, holding hands, even yeah. if we're not yeah. together for a second, uh, to say we're going to do this, we're going to be together, we are family. Um, and just create that, that energy of yeah. that. And by doing that in a circle, surrounded by a circle of audience members, we're just creating, I think, um, a, a connection between the audience and, and the humans on stage. Yeah. And letting everybody sort of be together for a second before we start telling the story. Yeah. But, if you really want to know, you're going to have to ask Ethan. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, any and other? Then, yes, please, the, please. At the end, right? Yeah, that's right. The end. Yes. Uh, so I'm, I'm assuming, we're talking about the, the aftermath the of the, exp yeah. of the explosion, or are we. So I'll just talk about the end in general. There's there's a moment at, at the end where there's a sound of an explosion mm -hmm. and the lights change to blackout mm -hmm. and they come back up uh, as there is a heartbeat drum and a sort of a static sort of uh, soundscape. Mm -hmm. And we come up on people lying in different positions all over the stage and um, we're invoking uh, the atomic bombs right. uh, in Japanese history. And then we start the turntable again to symbolize that people and go on right. after devastation. Um, 
It's very powerful. It is. And I get to walk into that and, and start the turntable again. And every night it's very moving. Yes. I don't have to act. I just have to stand <laughs> and look and it's there. Uh, so that's one of our still moments. And then the other still moment is after uh, just a lot of uh, chaos invoking sort of the modern world of consumption and uh, uh, waste mm -hmm. and consumerism and, uh, and technology, uh, there is a moment where we all stop and uh, I recap sort of the history of Japan being closed and exclusionary and now it's open to the world. And then we move on to the end. So I think those are the two moments of stillness at the end. Yeah, yeah. Um, and with that end, and I don't want to spoil too much for folks who haven't seen it yet. I, I mean, it's interesting because you, uh, you have new stats in the end yes, of the show. Yes, we do. Which really changed the, the tone for me. Is there, oh man, this is a hard question. <laughs> is there hope for Japan in, in the end of this show, in the, the, this version? What I think is interesting about this is I think he's, I think Ethan's opened it up to, is there hope for all of us yeah. at the end of the show? Yeah. And um, the answer has to be yes. It must be yes. Right. Uh, but he asks the question. Mm -hmm. He doesn't answer it. Right. right. We have to answer that question mm -hmm. uh, after, you know, and I, I love the new stats. Um, Weidman came in and worked with us and changing the stats was one of the things that he did. And um, you have to because the number is called next. Right. And next is always going to be different depending on when you do the show. Right. And so for all of us at this point, we're in a global world, a, a world where everybody is interconnected. Nobody can be a floating kingdom right. and keep everyone away. We're just too connected huh. now. And so um, I think it's interesting that Ethan looks, looked at Japan's problems and picked the ones that were pretty much universal yeah. now and say, and, and we have to all decide what's next Oof. after he asks that question at the end. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. James, another question from online. Do you have any sense of how Pacific Overtures has been received in Japan itself in the past? Okay, reception of the piece in Japan. Any ideas? Uh, I would guess that they're fascinated by it. Uh, one, because they continue to mount productions of Pacific Overtures. In fact, I believe there's one now. going on right now. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I would encourage everybody to go to YouTube and check out some of their uh, interpretations of the show. Um, I, I think it obviously speaks to Japanese people yeah. for whatever reason, uh, because they have, they have a fascination with this piece. They keep remounting it. And um, it is not like the king and I in Thailand, <laughs> you know, the Thai want, don't want anything to do with the king and I. Yeah. They, they find it disrespectful, they find it reductive and insulting. Um, and, you know, for good reason, if you're Thai. Right, right. And, uh, but the Japanese, obviously, um, don't feel that way about Pacific Overtures. It's amazing. Um, and a testament to the work that Sondheim and Weidman did. And yes. The, the, the research they did. Now, Weidman had came in, like you said, changed the stats. Were there other changes made to the book on this production? Yeah, there were some, um, there were some cuts. Uh, one thing that affected me directly, uh, among other things, but uh, this, he cut the proverbs. Mm. So he left in the haikus, um, which are all bird-based. <laughs> and then the proverbs were a commentary on action. And uh, I believe, what, from what I understand and what I, what I kind of heard is that he found them to be uh, condescending. Interesting. And um, he seemed like he didn't want, he, he was maybe a little bit um, uncomfortable with them now. Okay. And, uh, and too pointed and unnecessary huh. and inauthentic. Huh. Um, Good for him. So now he's, you know, he's kind of my hero as far as being a writer is concerned because he is somebody who doesn't have to change a word. Uh, this piece is in, in the canon. Yep. Uh, but he 
continues to be present to his piece and to the world and to the way his piece interacts with the contemporary world and uh, has chosen mm. to continue to work on it and make changes yeah. uh, so that it uh, speaks to us. Mm. And um, I, I just think that's amazing. It and is. he also gave Ethan just free reign um, once he knew that Ethan was to be trusted, I guess, <laughs> uh, artistically. Uh, he, he gave Ethan a lot of leeway. Wow. And I think, um, I think it's just lovely yeah. um, what, what we've been able to do here. I love it. Yeah. Um, did I see a hand? Yes, please. I heard you had only three weeks to put this together. How did you do that? Yeah, three weeks of rehearsal pro <laughs> a, a, a standard for us. Uh, how, how does that work? Well, with this piece particularly, um, I can tell you how, with a lot of tears, <laughs> literally. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't think I ever cried, but I, uh, there were moments of despair for all of us. It was really, um, it's a big lift to do uh, Sondheim, first of all. And this reduced casting, yeah. I'm sure, causes a lot of strain. I mean, the original Broadway cast was 31 people, I mm. believe, and we are 10. So that's that much more work. And uh, this cast is so versatile. Yes. I mean, the things that um, our people are doing is just heroic and amazing and so fun to watch, mm -hmm. to watch them just continually change costume and in inhabit another, another human. Uh, for, for a number or two. Uh, so I think um, one thing I noticed with this group is that it was rare that people would relax in rehearsal when they were not working with Ethan. Anytime somebody wasn't working in the center, if you looked around on the side, people were in their music stands looking at their scripts uh, or even just working on choreography you know, um, in the corner. Uh, we had to, yeah, and uh, we were. Uh, there was just a lot to do, and also, we knew that once we had the turntable uh, in tech, that would be a whole nother element, uh, along with the orchestra, right. and um, uh, we got it done. But uh, I, I would have to say, it felt like it took us down to the wire to really get to a place where um, we thought we could show other people yeah. <laughs> what we had been working on. We knew it was going to be good. It felt, we knew from the beginning mm. uh, that it, this was special, that yeah. this group was special, that Ethan was, had something really interesting to say. Yeah. And, um, and we were really excited and we could sense the potential for, for, some, for what has actually uh, occurred. But getting there, when we all knew it could happen, was probably, that's probably why it, at times it seems so um, difficult, because we knew what, what it could be, yeah. and it wasn't there yet. Huh. And um, that's what we were racing towards, and that's what we were like struggling to get to. It's like, <laughs> this is going to be great. We just gotta get it done. We just gotta get there. Yeah, and you have. I see James waving us down, uh, yes. So uh, Okay, this is a complicated question. We're talking about casting specifically Japanese people in this show, uh, and it's, it's not an all Japanese cast. No. So, here's what I will say. <laughs> <laughs> nor, is, uh, nor is Ethan of Japanese no. descent. Ethan is not of Japanese descent, but he, his family does have connections to Japan and J Japanese culture. Yeah. Um, to, you know, but I think as an Asian American actor, as an actor of Asian descent, um, we don't have a lot of opportunities. And uh, the doors are already closed to us for so many things. And to box us in further by limiting us to the <laughs> national origin of our, our family, um, yeah. it would make it impossible for us to work. And it would also make it impossible to keep any sort of talent pool going. Yeah. Uh, so once we start slicing and dicing Asian actors into Japanese, Chinese, Filipino, Vietnamese, Thai, <laughs> Everybody uh, has one show they can do if they're lucky. If 
if they're if even in. the one, right? right? Yeah. So um, that's just not something that should be a priority. Yeah. Uh, if there's a language requirement, then base it on the language, the facility mm -hmm. with the language. Mm -hmm. uh, but allow us the same sort of grace that uh, non-Asian actors have to play multiple nationalities. Right. Uh, to play multiple cultures and tell multiple stories about uh, different people. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I, I just, I, I don't really want to talk about whether, you know, yeah, course, we made an effort to right. cast Japanese people. Um, I will say uh, that our kabuki consultant, uh, our set designer, um, and our um, fight director mm -hmm. uh, were all Japanese mm -hmm. descent. Mm -hmm. And uh, they all had their eye on culture and, um, and also hybridization of, of American musical theater and intersecting that with Japanese culture. Right. You know, nothing uh, in, in musicals is purely one thing. It's always a hybrid of many different things. Yeah. It's a hybrid uh, art form. Right. And I mean, it, I don't know how into the weeds I want to get with this, yeah. but like, like even the, the kabuki stuff, is there, there's no moment of pure kabuki in this production, but you no. can see the influence over right. everything. It's over everything, yes. And I'll just say, uh, as a writer who's had his work produced, uh, I would never, ever limit uh, my casts to uh, Chinese people. Yeah. Or Chinese people from... Canton or Chinese people from the village, you know, from the <laughs> right. Toysan like, region mean, right. of Canton because those are the people who built the railroad in the 19th century. That's just not, I'm not interested in that and I think it would really not serve uh, the story or the piece. Yeah, absolutely. James. Uh, so piggybacking on that, there's a lot of interest in the chat about talking about your play. And, and cool. About Let's Let's pivot away from uh, Pacific Overtures for a bit and let's talk about your, your writer life. Okay. Uh, let's, so we can talk about falling into writing and then talk about Gold Mountain. And, yeah, let's, what led you into the writing world? Uh, this, we'll talk, okay. Yeah. Yes, the so. first thing, the first thing uh, this first musical that I wrote, Gold Mountain. Um, and you uh, did the book, lyrics, and music, music for yes. this. And mainly because it came to me in a very particular way. I had not been um, a writer uh, up until Gold Mountain. And um, I was on Broadway in Miss Saigon at the time that the impulse to write came to me. Hmm. And it, it did come to me <laughs> in the middle of a show uh, while I was waiting to go on. And it came to me in the form of a lyric and a melody um, that just popped in my head. Mm. And uh, it wouldn't leave me alone. Yeah. And I had written songs before, but I'd never written a show before. But this particular impulse was very strong and I became obsessed with it. And I wrote down this little piece of lyric and music and continued to write uh, for the next few months. <laughs> and uh, this, lyric this uh this fragment is still in the show and it's um literally a piece of a love duet in the middle of the show mm -hmm. and i wrote that song first before even knowing what the show was about or even uh being fully clear who was singing the song <laughs> but it just was so strong it literally called to me and so uh out of that grew um an entire musical yeah but that's how it came about wow yeah. And did you have training in, musically for, for composition or? No. Wow. Um, but going back to one of our first questions, uh, I spent a lot of time in orchestras, bands, uh. choirs. Uh, I was the guy in Miss Saigon who would arrange um, music for our sort of performances for Broadway Cares and, and things like that. Uh, so, and high school talent show I wrote yeah. all the charts for uh, <laughs> so there was a, there was there was a background in uh, writing music um, but I, I yeah I didn't have any formal composition um, training but for some reason I guess nobody ever told me no when I started putting notes on 
<laughs> paper. And so uh, it just kind of has always been a part of my life. Mm -hmm. What have been the most surprising things to you as you've gone down the writer path? What are the things where you go, I couldn't have imagined this being a challenge or being so delightful? Where, where have the surprises been? Uh, the surprises are how far <laughs> I've gotten as a writer. <laughs> um, when I first, first wrote uh, Gold Mountain and got it out there, I was very naive about how the whole thing worked mm -hmm. about being a writer and uh, also about uh, the kind of reception that a piece about Chinese railroad workers would get mm. um, in the sort of commercial uh, uh, theater space um, in the early 90s, uh, it was just not, there was not a lot of interest. Yeah. And, and there was actually um, quite a bit of hostility towards the piece. Wow. Uh, f I, I'm not exactly sure. Well, I, I think it was just maybe um, the world hadn't moved uh, in a direction where there could be an open mind to mm -hmm. something like this. Okay. Um, I guess because uh, I was a non-white writer of a musical and um, there were no white characters in the piece. You know, I, I just, I, I am literally trying to figure out why people were so mad about it. Uh, <laughs> literally angry. angry. Yeah. Fascinating. Literally angry um, about, uh, about getting, having this cross their desk. Wow. Uh, not everyone. Okay. But uh, there was just a lot of uh, very sort of uh, irrational <laughs> anger towards uh, the idea of this piece. Uh, literally one very sort of powerful Broadway producer said to me, well, stop trying to write a Broadway musical, and maybe you should concentrate on making Chinese opera more accessible to Westerners. I thought, <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I know. Like, <laughs> so literally just like, you are so other that you must, you know, you should work on, work on your own culture, which, I mean, there is Chinese, there is like Chinese opera pastiche in mm. Gold Mountain, but okay. it really sounds more like Cantonese pop music, because okay. that's what I heard when I was growing up. I don't have any background in Chinese, in Chinese opera. opera. Uh, so, <laughs> but the world changed. I mean, there was, what was interesting about how, you know, it took me 20 some years to finally get to a full production of this piece that was written that long ago. But wow. what's interesting is I got to see the world change by the reception to this piece. Every time, every huh. time I like had the wherewithal to deal with another round of it, rejection, I would put it back out there. Yeah. Um, periodically, and eventually I could see, oh, there's actually people who are not just, you know, tolerant of it, but interested in it. Right. And uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was an interesting way to watch the world change. It's uh, encouraging. It, was, it is encouraging. It's, yeah. It is encouraging. Are there future productions, or can uh, you talk about that? Uh, I would love to be able to not talk about a future production. <laughs> uh, there are a number of uh, theaters that have expressed interest Great. in uh, mounting the second production. Yeah. Um, and we're just in discussions. I mean, uh, artistic programming is a tricky puzzle, right? Right. And uh, budget is also a big part of that, and it's a big show. Mm. Um, but it would fit beautifully <laughs> in the max. Listen, listen up. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it, it really would. Um, it's, it's a, it's a, in fact, I, we were, we've been joking about it. There are actually, let's see, uh, four of us involved, who are involved with the world premiere of Gold Mountain, okay. uh, as well as Helen, Helen Q. Huang. Oh my goodness. Designed our costumes. Wow. Wow. So that, it is a that small... makes five of yeah. us uh, involved in Pacific Overtures. And we were joking that you could literally just take this set and just with some paint, <laughs> a few railroad tracks, and some leaves, we wow. could just do it there. <laughs> I hope you're all listening, artistic leadership. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, they've been getting all sorts of unsubtle hints from my, yeah. I love it. Um, and you've, over the last decade or so, really switched to just focusing on the writing, is that right? Yeah. So why that switch? Is it just because it just demands so much time, or? That's part of it. It, it really, sh it should be a full-time job. In yeah. fact, I feel like I'm playing hooky yeah. right now, um, but for good reason. I mean, I really do love, love being here. Um, also, 
agency. Yeah. Um, after a while, uh, I think the canon for Asian actors just kind of got me down. Yeah. Um, uh, I've done The King and I enough. I've done, You've done Miss, Miss Saigon, Saigon enough. Uh, flower Drum Song, too, yes, I'm the, assuming. Yes, I did yeah. Flower Drum Song. Yeah. And so... <laughs> That's it. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I'm working... I, I will... Uh, I have been doing readings and workshops for friends who have write, written new pieces. Great. Because that's, that's kind of like, you know, it's... it's that's important to do, and I, I love doing that, working with people I know. Um, but yeah, so I think that's what it is. It's like, um, Bayark Lee has kicked me in the butt many times when I've gotten down. Yeah. And uh, she has, uh, she keeps me going. And she, or what she has said to me the, the first time I said I was going to stop writing is like, you're not allowed to. You know, it doesn't matter how tired or burnt out you are or discouraged you are you have the ability to write stories and write roles for us. And that's your responsibility yeah. to, to continue to do that for as long as you can. And you know, Bayork is like the Energizer Bunny. And <laughs> she, so I, I couldn't tell her I was too tired or too burnt out to go on because she's going on. Yeah. You know, she pushes and pushes and pushes and she doesn't stop mm -hmm. and um, you know, she's she's a mentor, and she's also sort of my inspiration. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Uh, Barbara, sorry, I forgot you had a question like 15 well, minutes I, ago. It's still here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I just wonder if this his, uh, production of Pacific Overtures is your favorite, and <laughs> so, uh, and and if it is, you know. I, I sense that a lot of that has to do with Ethan. Mm -hmm. And what I'm concerned about, is Ethan going to have to travel all over the world <laughs> to continue this, what he's put into this production? So for our friends at home, questions were, is this your favorite production of Pacific Overtures? <laughs> Loaded. And uh, uh, if it is, we're, uh, we, 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 uh, how to rephrase this question? Is it, um, <laughs> um, do we think the success of this production is because of Ethan? Do we think that Ethan's going to have to travel the world just remounting Pacific Overtures? Um, there was a lot there, Barbara. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think you know any actor who's in a production of something has perfect has the perfect right to say that this is my favorite production of Pacific Overtures. Um, whether I'm in it or watching it, this is definitely for me. Uh, I, I, yeah. And I'll, I'll just say it yeah. with, with no qualifications. Uh, there are certainly many beautiful productions of Pacific Overtures that have happened now and will happen. Um, but this one, uh, I think, uh, uh, has unlocked something in the piece mm -hmm. that hasn't been seen before. Um, it is Ethan's vision of it, but it's also there's been some excellent casting yes. going on uh, with this ca company. Um, Johnny mm -hmm. and Daniel yes. <laughs> are paired so yes. perfectly. They are, uh, they have, you know, it's not, it's not a romantic story, but they have so much chemistry. Mm -hmm. And they, they embody their characters in such a specific way that is just so complementary to each other. And uh, you, you really, it really reinforces this idea of how these two characters um, change um, with watching the two of them yeah. enact this change. So, uh, and then, you know, you've got all these great character actors um, <laughs> and the uh, Quint Me and Chani yes. and uh, Chris. <laughs> oh my gosh, you must be so proud of them. They're yes. so good. Yes. They're so amazing. I, I hope they, they work here all the time. They're just <laughs> fantastic. Um, so yes, definitely my favorite. Uh, as to whether Ethan has to travel the world to um, continue to remount this production, I hope he gets to if he yeah. wants that. Um, I know he's, he's got a lot of wor work to do here too, and I think he's got a lot of ideas <laughs> For uh, for how to continue to create like just brilliant things for 
audience is a signature and um, it would be a shame to lose him. So I think yes. you should want him to stay right and, here. And hopefully, like you said, this production has unlocked its possibilities for other directors and it will I, be I the beginning so. of something. I, 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 I hope so. I mean, a lot of people have come to see yes. this. Uh, there's, that Amtrak has just been unloading New Yorkers <laughs> left and right. Uh, and, um, you know, the fact that uh, John Weidman came uh, came to our rehearsals and then saw the show twice. Yeah. And uh, he has also, he has gone on record, mm -hmm. so I can say yep. it, as saying that this is um, the funniest version of Chrysanthemum Tea he has ever seen. Uh, and he has been similarly uh, very, very uh, complimentary about the entire production. Yeah. He, he He's very moved by this production um, in a very profound way. and. He's come to talk to us more than once, yeah. just to talk to us as a group. So what he's a obviously very much, uh, I don't know, there's something that connects deeply with him mm -hmm. about this particular production. And so I'm sure that he too will also uh, have some helpful sort of guidance for uh, future uh, leaders who are, are directing this <coughs> production, this show. I hope so. We are winding down. We only have a few minutes left. Questions from the audience or questions online? Yes. I didn't hear you say when the premiere was Golden Mountain. Oh, yes. The, uh, uh, where did uh, Gold Mountain premiere? Talk oh. about that original production. The original production was at the um, Utah Shakespeare Festival in 2021. Mm -hmm. And uh, it starred Johnny <laughs> and Ali Ewald. Amazing. In fact, uh, during the run, <laughs> of the show, uh, Johnny and I were in the room helping Ali film her audition for She Loves Me. <laughs> <laughs> so love full circle. Yes. Uh, it came about because um, the executive director at Utah Shakespeare Festival came and saw a concert that we did for the 150th uh, anniversary of the completion of the railroad um, in Salt Lake City mm -hmm. and um, Ogden. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, and Helen came and <laughs> designed our costumes. So uh, it's, it was a really um, profound and lovely uh, experience. Um, we were able to attract a lot of Asian people Amazing. in Utah yeah. <laughs> uh, to come to the show. And they came more than once, mm. actually, uh, because it was just, they connected very deeply with it. Yeah. And uh, I'm hoping uh, we continue to do that. It's a story. Um, by us, for us, yeah. um, but uh, people, people in general, just really connected to it. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from our friends here or my friends online, Barbara? One more. One more. <laughs> I just have to say, this is a comment. I've seen the show twice. Now you've made me want to see it a third time. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if that's possible because I think it's sold out. But I, but I may. Figure it out. Yeah, so the, the comment from Barbara, seen the show twice, loved it, but this conversation has made me want to see it more. Don't know if I can. I've been checking the website and like single tickets are popping up and disappearing quickly, so just keep yep. checking. Um, if you're aggressive about it, I think you'll find a way. Um, and Godspeed. The box, op uh, is, box office is open right yeah, now. Yeah, box office is open, so on your way out, everybody, stop on by, ask for an extra ticket. Yeah. Um, so, w winding down final minutes, um, what are favorite productions that you have worked on through your career? Okay. Uh, well, Gold Mountain, of yeah, course. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that will always be kind of this seminal, amazing uh, experience to get from a fragment of a song in 1995 to a full production in 2021. That's yeah. a, like a big chunk of my life spent on uh, a single thing. And it, that it actually happened is kind of amazing. Yeah. Uh, and something I had long ago sort of like let go of. I just thought as far as it gets, it's going to be good enough because it's already, you know, it's, it's out there. But we got across the finish line. Yeah. And now I want more. <laughs> uh, you know, it's odd. My favorite productions tend not to be the ones that are very fancy. Okay. 
um, you know, it's always the little things. Like uh, in 1997, we did an all Asian production of Falsetto Land. Okay. At cool. the Vineyard Theater. And uh, I can't tell you, like, Anne Harada played Trina. Okay. And oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. So it was that kind of a thing. Yeah. And it was, uh, it was amazing. Um, Francis uh, Jew was also involved. Mm. Um, hmm. We had, uh, I don't know why, but people actually are still talking about that particular little summer thing that we did just for ourselves that blew up and had to extend <laughs> and got all sorts of press. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's shows like that that are more important to me and actually more fulfilling to me than like doing cats. Cats, yeah. Or even, or even Miss Saigon yeah. on Broadway. Um, it was really exciting to be a part of that. Uh, and uh, I'll always be grateful because of all the friends that I was, have, had been able to make there. And also because it, so it really changed the, what would I call it? The sort of the, the geography of, of the talent pool mm. in um, New York City. Uh, up until, this is di a digression, but I'll, I'll just <laughs> go with it. Up until Miss Saigon, uh, there was not really a sustainable talent pool of Asian actors mm -hmm. in New York City because these big shows would only come once every two decades or so. So that's just not enough to sustain a, a musical theater pool. Right. Right. Uh, once Miss Saigon happened, and once, uh, and it was a 10 year run, uh, we created a sustainable talent pool that has never gone away. It's, it's only grown. That's amazing. And uh, that is the gift and the blessing of Miss Saigon, as far wow. as I'm concerned. It yeah. created a sustainable musical theater community of Asians. And um, I think that is one of the reasons why we've been able to, to more work has been created, mm -hmm. more work has been written. Yeah. Because now people are, writers are seeing that there is a pool, they are inspired by the pool. Um, so many talented people. Mm. Uh, and it just keeps getting better and, keep, and it keeps growing. And, uh, you know, people like Ali Ewald can come and do She Loves Me, yeah. you know, and play um, Amalia. And she's amazing. Mm -hmm. She got to do, uh, she's the first Asian American, the only Asian American uh, Christine, Christine in yeah. Phantom of the Opera. Um, that may not have happened without Miss Saigon. Right. Because her seeing the show inspired her to continue um, wow. into it, into the, into the field. And yeah. I think that's the other thing, is that uh, seeing somebody like Leia Salonga um, become a star uh, created dreams and possibilities. And, you know, Asian, Asian immigrant parents didn't have to have that talk with their kids about this doesn't happen for us. Wow. Right? Yeah. Um, because there it was. It was happening. Yeah. And um, more and more people were able to... <laughs> That's amazing. To, to break the mold and keep on going. That is a conversation about Miss Saigon we should be having more often, I think. That's, yeah. I've never, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, we are, we are at, at time, but before, but I have one last question for you oh, before, okay. we, before we wrap it up. So <clears throat> you had the option as a, as a youngster to opt out of theater and to do something else. You were strongly encouraged to, mm -hmm. to opt out, but you didn't. Mm -hmm. um, how has theater fed you? What does it give you that the other lives you think couldn't have? I think that's just who I am. Yeah. You know, um, uh, even if I had gone away from it, and I have, I've taken breaks from it, um, it's still essentially who I am as mm. a theater artist. Uh, my younger sisters, one became uh, a civil rights lawyer and the other one became a doctor. And so they filled in for me yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and achieved uh, what my parents thought that I should be uh, what I'd be doing. But uh, I think uh, for many of us, it isn't really even about what theater gives you. It's just who you are. Mm. Yeah, and uh, when you're not, and when you don't live in the life that you were meant to live, I think that can create all sorts of problems and dysfunction yeah. in your life. So um, I'm grateful for theater. Yeah. Uh, it is it is not the easiest life for sure, but uh, 
I don't think I actually have a choice in the matter. <laughs> <laughs> I understand completely. Because I was a good boy. Yeah. <laughs> so for me to rebel in such a substantial way uh, means that the pull was really, really strong. Yeah. Well, we are all grateful for your rebellion <laughs> and are grateful that you were able to spend some time with us today. Thank That's you so okay. much, Jason. Thank and you. thanks to all of you. We'll see you back in May to meet with Raymond Caldwell. Have a good afternoon.